My name is Hannah Van Den Brook. Um, I am representing Extinction Rebellion. Uh, disclosure is, well, disclaimer is that I am no climate scientist, um, relatively new to activism, although I've been concerned about climate change for a long time. I am a musician and a music teacher, um, and I've not really ha ever had a proper job, so both Ian's talk um, about kind of stepping out of the capitalist bullshit system and um, Elaine's talk about education hit home um, and feel very true to my values. Um, but yes, I'm here I'm representing Extinction Rebellion today. I've been volunteering with them since January, most days, every day, um, helping organize this kind of thing and um, generally getting more people on board to what I think is a very um, hopeful movement. So um, this is the first time I've given this talk. It's happening all over the country and uh, now the world um, and inviting people to think about what our environmental situation is and um, especially climate change and what we can do about it. So the talk, um, it's called Heading for Extinction and What to Do About It. So especially here on the Eastern Road, um, we get a picture of some of the kind of environmental degradation that humans are causing. Um, so we've got the dirty air, there's depleted soil, contaminated water, mountains of garbage, oceans drowning in plastic. Half the world's animals have vanished since 1970. In Germany, three quarters of insects have disappeared in the last 25 years. Some people are choosing to close their eyes and ears to reality. We want to tell the truth. So, the talk structure is in two parts. Um, firstly, we're going to talk about environmental science, what it means to be heading for extinction, and then we're going to talk briefly about the social and political science, um, the philosophy behind Extinction Rebellion, and their ideas about what we can do about it. So, we've already had a little chat to our neighbor, uh, neighbors. Um, it might not have been specifically about climate change or the environmental situation. So maybe you can have another minute and share some ob observations, some things that you've seen changing um, in the last few years. Uh, and we'll reconvene and you can maybe shout some out at me, see how we're feeling about it. So are there any um, observations that anyone wants to share? Okay. So that crazy warm weather that we had for about two weeks in February, which brought out all the daffodils ridiculously early, it also brought out the bumblebees. And I remember seeing a huge, huge, huge bumblebee on the pavement in the middle of February, looking at it, thinking, you poor creature, what are you doing? Go back to bed. <laughs> right? I'm now finding myself hoping that we get a frost before sort of mid-April so that everything restarts itself, because otherwise the bees are going to have a real struggle this year. And it's deeply concerning. It's a good observation. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Somebody over here was talking about um, um, spontaneous personal bleed from actually walking past what she now knows is a 5G mast. Um, so obviously radio frequency overkill, untested, and non-impact assessed. Scary things. There are scary things that we can see with our own eyes now, and there are scary things that we might not be able to see with our eyes, but we're starting to understand. And then there are scary things that other people are understanding far away from us, but today already. Um, 
my mum lives in Australia. I've stopped flying, so it's a bit of a problem. But I hear um, that the fish have the, there are fish in entire lakes of fish are floating to the surface because the heat is reducing the amount of oxygen in the, in, in the lakes um, and it making them completely uninhabitable. Um, yeah, there are scary scary things happening. Um, and it's important to face them, but also we need solutions. So hopefully I can provide you with some today. Um, so I'm gonna skip a couple. This is again the, the structure of the talk. Uh, why are we heading for extinction? And then what should we do about it? So um, this is about the precautionary principle. Um, which is applied to most areas in public life. Health and safety regulations are absolutely everywhere if you look out for them. But when it comes to the environment, we completely neglect the precautionary principle. I'm gonna talk mainly about climate change today, but we are concerned as a movement about the broader environmental picture as well. Um, climate change is one of the things that's harder to see. Um, it's been around very publicly for decades. Um, the year that I was born, actually, 1988, was the climate summer where um, we had a big media push for uh, understanding that climate change was dangerous and it was human-induced. So that's 31 years ago, and we're still doing very, very little about it. Um, so most of the information that we get about climate change um, and is accepted as kind of gospel truth, uh, comes from the IPCC, which is a UN um, intergovernmental panel on climate change. Um, and however, um, there are quite good reasons for questioning some of the, the, the conclusions. So the most recent conclusion uh, that's been hot, hot on the press is came out last year and said that we have 12 years to do something about climate change. And if we don't, then uh, we're heading for horrific consequences. Um, so Extinction Rebellion believes that that's actually uh, incorrect, that we have much less time. Um, and that's based on a couple of things. Um, I'm gonna give you only two of the reasons, but um, the IPCC can take three to four years for new findings to be published, is one of the big ones. And also the IPCC's summary for policymakers is voted on by diplomats and not scientists. So, yeah, we believe that IPCC has a systemic tendency to understate um, the situation on climate and produces estimates that are too conservative. So a good example of this, of the IPCC's um, predictions being incorrect um, uh, with the Arctic ice melting. So in 2007, the summer retreat of the Arctic ice widely outdistanced all 18 IPCC computer models. One scientist estimated that it was melting 100 years ahead of schedule. Um, it's findings like these that have made, sign, uh, made experts become pessimistic about the state of play. A guy called Professor Hans Joachim Charles Huber, uh, who advises Pope Francis, Angela Merkel, and the EU, has said um, in, in his foreword to a paper last year called What Lies Beneath that the Understatement of Existential Climate Risk. Uh, that climate change is now reaching the end game. The issue is the very survival of our civilization. So what is happening and why is it so very bad? I'm going to talk about a few things that we're seeing happen that um, we most people don't know about. Um, I think climate has been in the news more recently, um, and there are still things that people should know about that they don't know about. 
even if they're pretty informed. Um, so one is that there is a certain amount of climate change that is fully locked in, um, that our actions in the past uh, are going to catch up with us. And, and yes, so that's one of the things. Um, we are currently seeing global temperatures of around 1.1 Celsius above pre-industrial levels, taken to be the temperature of the Earth in around 1850. Before we look at what may cause in the uh, what may cause these in the future, yeah, it's good to know that certain temperature increases are already locked in. In other words, they've been caused by past activity and are unavoidable. Back in 1995, 6.3 billion metric tons of CO2 were already being released into the atmosphere every year. That's 6.3 billion metric tons, or nearly a ton, a ton per person per year. So this is going to catch up with us now, uh, kind of whatever. Um, and uh, we're seeing things like feedback loops. So this is about melting ice. Um, the albedo effect. Um, so ice has a bright surface and it reflects the sun's rays, protecting us from the greenhouse effect. But as temperatures rise, more and more ice melts, um, less and less sunlight is reflected and the darker water absorbs the heat. Um, so warming accelerates even more which means that it's a system that feeds into it, itself and accelerates exponentially. So that's one example of a feedback loop. Um, here's a second. Uh, the Amazon rainforest um, is one of the greatest carbon sinks in the world. So it sucks up large amounts of CO2. It also exchanges gases and water with the atmosphere and the Atlantic Ocean. So the trees transfer large volumes of water from the soil to the atmosphere through transpiration, um, which is all a good thing. Um, but the deforestation of the Amazon is already very serious. By 2013, it had taken three times the area of the UK. Uh, this causes a decrease in forest transpiration, which means less rain which results in less growth. The dry season becomes even longer. There are more forest fires. More carbon is released than captured. Surface roots of trees are damaged. Large trees die and whole ecosystems are damaged. So this could lead, um, or there are now concerns that the Amazon rainforest will reach a tipping point a sudden collapse from a forest equilibrium to a savanna equilibrium. Um, this is predicted to happen once we have destroyed 40% of the forest. In 2014, 20% of the forest had been destroyed with an additional 20% of the original area being affected. So we're not far off. Uh, a 2014 paper called The Future Climate of Amazonia concludes if we choose to carry on the business as usual, theory suggests that the whole Amazon system may collapse in less than 10 years. The IPCC, coming back to them, their models assume we will not reach any tipping points in the near future, either in the Arctic or the Amazon. But we believe that their optimism is a denial of reality. So, here are some of the tipping points. You might recognize some of them. Um, so, sorry, they're, they're show some of the main weather patterns that support the planet. Um, for example, the jet stream that protects Britain from harsher winters like the ones in Russia. So these are at risk of um, experiencing huge changes if tipping points happen. So what happens if temperatures increased? As we reach the limit of two degrees increase in global temperature, there is a danger that the feedback loops will kick in, leading to abrupt changes that will then trigger tipping cascades. From tipping points to tipping cascades or runaway climate change.
So this is about the ecological overshoot. Um, so the biggest factor driving these changes, changes um, in our environment is the ecological overshoot. A country has an ecological footprint, let's call it our consumption levels. It also has a biocapacity, which is the sum total of its ecological assets. Let's call that our ecological budget. If our consumption levels are bigger than our budget, then we run a deficit called an ecological overshoot. So, in 2018, the world used up its yearly budget by August, um, which means that at the moment we're using 1.7 planet Earths per year. In the UK, um, in 2018, we used up our country's budget by um, May, the 8th of May. This kind of taps into a bigger picture of global inequality. Um, so China, the US, and Europe account for over 50% of the total carbon uh, emissions that we've ever had worldwide, um, whereas countries in, uh, so the bottom 30 countries account for less than 1%. Um, and many of them are countries like Africa that are already experiencing devastating impacts of um, climate change and causing about, um, food scarcity and consequently forced migration that we're seeing um, massively uh, on the rise. This is the last thing I want to say before we move on to more hopeful things. Um, but the world population is expected to grow to almost 10 billion by 2050 with 2.3 billion more mouths to feed, and the growing desire of the middle class for meat and dairy in developing countries. Global demand for food could increase by between 59 and 98%. <coughs> so, uh, just a little excerpt from a book um, about what this might mean. Um, so this is from Timothy Snyder's book, Bloodlands, Europe between Hitler and Stalin. In Ukraine cities, hundreds of thousands of people waited each day for a simple loaf of bread. People appeared at two o'clock in the morning to queue in front of shops that did not open until seven. On an average day, 40,000 people would wait for bread. Those in line were so desperate to keep their places that they would cling to the belts of those immediately in front of them. Some were so weak from hun hunger that they could not stand without the ballast, uh, ballast of strangers. <coughs> the waiting lasted all day and sometimes for two. Pregnant women and, main, and maimed war veterans had lost their right to buy out of town and had to wait in line with the rest if they wanted to eat. Somewhere in a line, a woman would wail, and the moaning would echo up and down the line, so that the whole groups of thousands sounded like a single animal with an elemental fear. Survival was a moral as well as a physical struggle. The good people died first. Those who refused to steal or to prostitute themselves died. Those who who gave food to others died. Those who refused to eat corpses died. Those who refused to kill their fellow man died. Parents who resisted cannibalism died before their children. So this is what happens to communities when we run out of natural resources. When we talk about climate disaster and the ecological crisis, this is the kind of story we're talking about. So, why we're called Extinction Rebellion. Um, we've experienced five major extinctions in the past. The biggest one was the Permian mass extinction. Uh, then 96% of life on Earth died. For a while, scientists assumed that they were caused by asteroid strikes. 
but several independent scientific studies concluded that actually four of them were caused by sudden increases in atmospheric greenhouse gases, especially CO2. What seems most likely was that these levels of greenhouse gases were caused by volcanic eruptions and resulted in a complete meltdown of the ice caps. There was no significant difference in temperature between the equator and the ice cap regions, which oriented a loss of wind and ocean currents. This led to stagnant water, which released hydrogen sulfide into the atmosphere, which made it impossible for mammals to breathe. So a bit like what we're already seeing with the fish in the lakes. At the moment, the rate at which we're pumping CO2 into the atmosphere is higher than during the Permian, so the biggest mass extinction. So it's already said that we are in um, the sixth mass extinction. Uh, species are going extinct all the time, um, but the extinction rates at the moment are unprecedented um, in our lifetime, well, in humanity's um, time, and alarming. So let's remember from earlier that 50% of the world's animals have vanished since 1970. And we're facing now a world where 60% of mammals on Earth are livestock, 36% are humans, and only 4% are wild. So I'm going to finish with this um, quote from Ramathan, Ramanath. Um, from the University of California. He says that if we carry on the way uh, we are at the moment, we run a 5% risk of global warming of more than 5 degrees centigrade. At a warming of 4 degrees centigrade, 74% of the world population would be living in an area of deadly heat. 4 degrees would also result in hundreds of millions of people dying of hunger hard to imagine how humans would adapt to five degrees. So this leads us back to where we started, the precautionary principle, and Ram and Rathan's conclusion, which is, to put it in perspective, how many of us would choose to buckle our grandchildren to an airplane seat if we knew that there was a one in 20 chance of the plane crashing? With climate change that poses ex existential threats, we have already put them in that plane. So, we saw the youth strike yesterday, which was very hopeful. Um, and when I kind of introduce why that kind of thing has to happen, um, our government is doing things like uh, proposing and continuing the plans to build a new F, uh, runway at Heathrow. It's fracking um, and budget wise. It's listening to the people uh, who are, what's the word? When, yes, what's the word for people who are lobbying? Yeah, lobbying. So a lot of their money is still coming from sticky sources. So, I'm going to skip back to this. In the 2018, the UK's Climate Change Committee demonstrated that the UK is not on track to meet its climate targets, even when they have been set at two degrees. At the moment, we're facing a crisis on an unprecedented level, and not only are our politicians not even taking minimal resources to their measures to protect their country from the crisis, it seems more likely that they are actively worsening it. So social res responses, um, we at Extinction, Rebellion uh, invite everyone from all sides of the political spectrum to join join us. Um, we believe that it's a movement for everyone. Um, and Locke and we've got representatives of the left and right here. Um, so
also Locken, Hobbes, and his social contract. So they both basically say that if the government isn't looking after you, uh, then you have the right, um, and uh, Locke says, the duty to rebel. So inspiration. inspiration. Um, during the Second World War, the whole economy was transformed to serve the purpose of winning the war. It was called the total war economy. This gives us a context of what is econ economically feasible. Uh, Extinction Rebellion have a few demands. Um, there are more if you want to look at their website, but these are the core things that we're asking to happen. Um, the first is that we tell the truth and act as if the truth is real. Um, so that's a demand, a personal demand for everyone involved and individuals, and it's also a demand on our government. Um, the second is that we reach net zero um, carbon by 2025. And our kind of idea about how this could happen in a fair way would be to form a citizens' assembly, uh, which is like a giant jury that would be advised by experts um, in science, the science of in environmental science, um, and vote on whether or not we're in a climate emergency. So if they did, then the government would have to act as though the truth was real and make the right kind of policy changes. So, a bit more on the citizens' assemblies. Basically, um, so we're working with the Sortition Foundation, and they specialize in set setting up citizens' assemblies. Sortition is the use of random selection to populate assemblies or fill political positions. <laughs> An assembly based on sortition would be a representative, random sample of people making decisions in an informed, fair, and deliberative setting. It would, we've seen it be successful recently um, with the abortion laws in Ireland two years ago, um, and it's also been successful in gay marriage and nuclear waste in New South Wales. So something that someone said to me the other day, which I thought was really poignant, is um, that the Gilets jaunes um, would never have got to where they are now with their discontent, discontent of the, the, so the French um, strikers um, protesting against inequality, basically. But the, the movement started with them protesting quite specifically about uh, the rise is on uh, fuel tax, so car tax, um, and a citizens' assembly would prevent us from creating unequal policies. We tax the rich um, more <laughs> than we tax the poor um, when it comes to carbon to make it fair, and a citizens' assembly would make sure that happens because they would be in charge of creating a fair system of policies. So, um, what does it mean to be involved in Extinction Rebellion? Um, I'm kind of going to go off text now because I've been involved uh, a while. Um, it, for me, it was like stepping over out of the shadows and into a little island of light. Um, I, I feel like I'm finally spending my time doing things that are fitting with what I believe. Um, which I was trying to do before as a music teacher and um, a lot of it, but now it feels a lot more honest. Um, we're a holacracy, which means that um, these islands of light are everywhere. Um, and we're not trying to be a centralized body, but um, create autonomy, or autonomy is um, created everywhere that people are caring uh, about the, the movement. Um, so we're known, who, who here might have heard of the bridges closing back in November, Extinction Rebellion? 
So we closed five bridges back in November, um, and it was front page news in The Guardian. Um, recently, we had The Blood of Our Children. So, Blood of Our Children, um, likewise, made front page news but on The Times, which was quite interesting. Um, so, it's making, making waves, partly because we're getting ourselves arrested. So, that's um, one of our one of our tactics, I suppose, that is different to other climate change groups, um, is to show um, that we are ready to sacrifice um, to show the extent to which this is urgent. Basically, communicating the urgency of, of uh, the situation. So, a little bit more on that. Um, we have some brilliant, heroic examples of people who have used these tactics in the past. Um, so, an example is the civil rights movement in the US. Conventional political approaches um, have not brought any structural change. But from the mid-1950s, Martin Luther King and the American Black Civil Rights Movement changed to a strategy of civil disobedience. They were able to bring about significant changes in policy through direct action campaigns that involved several hundred people going to prison and several thousand arrests. So here are some of the heroes of that movement. Um, it's really important to note that we are an entirely peaceful movement. Um, so we, we practice non-violent direct action um, and we do that in kind of our uh, every day, as well as in the actions uh, on the streets. So that means communicating in advance um, to police and letting them know what our plans are so that they can work with us rather than against us. Um, it, means, it means treating, no blaming and shaming, treating people uh, with love because that's why we're, we're doing what we're doing. Um, and I think a really good moment that exemplifies that kind of feeling was uh, in the second day of rebellion. We, we had a funeral day um, that started in Parliament Square. Everyone was dressed, there were about a few thousand of us. Everyone was dressed in black and we had a coffin and um, we dug uh, a grave in Parliament Square. We started digging. And uh, the police kind of clocked onto what was happening. They were on the kind of border. And so everyone linked arms around the digging. And the police, obviously it was their duty to stop what was happening. Um, and they had to break through everyone's arms to get to the patch of grass that they eventually kettled. And in this time, because violence was escalating, uh, the person on the mic started singing, uh, Mike started singing a peace song, and everyone in the crowd from Extinction Rebellion joined in in this peace song um, as the police were kind of addressing their own anger and, and, and violence because they, they were having to be violent. And there was this real conflict of them realizing that we were peaceful, but also continuing in the system that they're strongly a part of. So, um, yeah, we're a peaceful movement trying to cause disruption to a system that is violent, um, is the idea. So I'm just going to round up now. I've kind of lost track of where I was. But, um, I've got a couple of questions for you. Just a minute of silence before we finish. Um, and I'm going to Get us to ask ourselves, me included, um, given what we've just heard, what does it mean to be a good human? What does it mean to die without regret? regret? And will you be able to look at your grandchildren in the eye and said that you did what you could?
So courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. And kind of brings us back to the precautionary principle of the beginning. This is the moment before um, before they cut off the Parliament Square patch of grass, saving the saving the earth. <laughs> um, so a couple of uh, tiny announcements. One is that our office is about two minutes walk from here. If you wanted to uh, offer any time volunteering, we are uh, arms wide open. Uh, David, who organised today, came for a couple of days and was very uh, willing to help, which was great. And um, yeah, we need all hands on deck. Um, the other thing is that we are now in over 38 countries, um, so having been around publicly since November. So exciting things are happening. Uh, it's very hopeful. And um, we're aiming towards an international rebellion starting the 15th of April. So if you're planning to take holidays, that's the time to holiday. Um, and join us, um, yeah, join us on the streets in London. And there'll be people moving in from all over England, walk, walking into London. Um, they've already started actually in Cornwall. So yeah, exciting, exciting things to be found after that. Um, thank you. Thanks.